Well, good morning, church family. So, wow, that was a good, good morning. Proud of you, proud of you. So glad that you're here. If you're joining us for the first time, it's exciting for us to have you today because right after the worship service, we have a new thing that we have called the feast. So we've been looking forward to that. It's an exciting opportunity for you to get to know some people. It was Queen Elizabeth II who once said, Family does not necessarily mean blood relatives, but often a description of a community, an organization, or a nation. And I would add to that a church family. So, I mean, this is community for us and would love for you to be with us today to celebrate after our life group hour. Talk about life groups. If you have not attended a life group, we want to encourage you to be a part of one. All you have to do is go to one of our welcome centers or find the little small guy that's standing in the back, David Jordan, and he'll direct you <laughs> to where you need to go. And uh, we'll love to have you in a, uh, in a life group. If you're new with us, we'd love to also for you to consider joining our church. Uh, next Sunday, we have Entry Point. And Entry Point is an opportunity for those of you who have been coming for a little while uh, and have not yet joined the church to join us. Entry Point will tell you about who we are, where we're headed, and things like that. And uh, I, I hope that you consider that and uh, that you will perhaps maybe even become part of our church family. So now if you have a copy of God's Word... Will you please join me in opening it to 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. Let me give you a small little side note here because this is, this is important. We want to give you a hard copy of God's Word if you don't have one. We encourage our church family to do that so that way you can follow along. And uh, if you don't have one, just go to the Welcome Center as well and grab one. It will be our gift to you. Queen Elizabeth II also said this, To what greater inspiration and counsel... Can we turn then to the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, the Bible? She understood that. Praise God for that. Let's read the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Verse 18 of 1 John chapter 2. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father, ha the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who were trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true, and it is no lie, just as, I, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Wow, there are many things that we can glean from this text this morning. So let's start with verse 18. He begins by saying, children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. John, in his pastoral style here, is addressing the church, beginning with the word children, which we have looked at in past weeks as an enduring term. And as Andrew said just a moment ago, church is like family, right? So that is what he's doing. He's addressing the family of God. Now, he does that, and then the and, and what's going on here is he's wants, he wants to tell them about two things that are taking place. Number one, we are all in the last days. He uses the term here in the ESV, the last hour. Number two, the Antichrist is coming, and so are some Antichrists, plural. Which leads to my first point this morning is this, that Christ followers need to remain vigilant against non-orthodox belief. Now, what's orthodox belief? Orthodox belief is correct or right belief, right doctrine. The first thing that John brings up here is that we're in the last hours. In verse 17, just as we looked last week, look at what it says. The world is passing away along with its desires. So again, we are in the last hours. There's one important distinction to be made here. There is a difference between the 
last day and the expression last days, or as he uses here, last hour. The last day is a reference in scripture to the day of the Lord. It's that one day when Christ will return, finally come back in his second advent, his second coming to finally bring us up to glory. The expression last days or last hour refers to the period starting with Christ's first coming until the end comes. So what that means is that we are in the last days, aren't we? From John's point of view here, things were going from bad to worse. People were seeking darkness and some heretics were even trying to distort the truth of Christ to fit their own ideology. Sounds familiar? The evil one and his minions. Banana! No, it's not that kind of minion. (laughs) Not that kind of minion. And his minions are trying and were trying to destroy orthodox belief and fellowship. So John was calling believers to remain vigilant and to understand that the days are evil. Paul also warned Timothy and the church. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5, here's what he says about the last days. He says, but understand this. That it is the la- we, that in, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpleasable, unpleasable. Sorry, slanderous, without self control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with the conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Now these things are certainly apparent in our days, aren't they? All this, this list here, we can all see it. And they're all part of the gospel of the evil one. Satan preaches this and people like it. All you have to do is go on social media and you have some few examples of that, won't you? Just go to Instagram or TikTok and you'll see ungodliness all around. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying they will show you some bad if you allow yourself to see those things. Are you following me here? Some kids have even committed suicide because of certain platforms like that. There's evil in that. There's ungodliness around. Life is no longer valued but rather discarded as something trivial. Movies portray gore and murder and a complete disregard for life. And sad to say, some of us have become desensitized. Our culture has become desensitized to it. Pride, arrogance, abuse, sexual immorality, some of these things that Paul referred to here that John is alluding to as well are sold as entertainment for people to continue to enjoy through the spurring on of the evil one, onto more ungodliness. One example of people being lovers of self, brutal and heartless, is displayed in the pro-abortion movement. Some of our top politicians and cultural warriors now support abortion up to the point of birth, claiming that women have the right to take a child's life for mere convenience. A National Right to Life documents that from 1973 to 2017, 60 million lives have been lost to abortion. It's a tragedy. But it's happening before our very eyes, isn't it? Again, that's just one example that we are indeed living in the last days. Speaking of the last days, Jesus said, this is Matthew chapter 24. Verses 7 through 12, he says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of birth pains of the last days. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So you see, Jesus himself also warned us about the last day. Now, note that one of the characteristics of the last day is that false prophets will arise. They will lead many astray. Now, it was happening in John, John's time as, just as, as it is right now, right? So what do we do? Do we freak out that this is taking place? That we are in the last days? Well, I would contend no. In fact, we're told to eagerly await Christ's return. Because brothers and sisters, Jesus will be back. He will be back. 
And he will take us up to glory. Those of us who have believed in Jesus, repented of our sins, confessed our sins, who have received Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we will go to glory with him. He will bring his peace and he will restore and mend all that is broken and make things new, all things new. We should look forward to that, amen? So no matter how bad the world is, we have hope. So the consummation of God's kingdom which began with Christ's first coming, his death on the cross, his resurrection, will all day will culminate in that one day when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, though John was speaking of the last hour, we, we don't know when the last hour will come. So until then, we're tasked to, as John says earlier in the book, to walk in the light, to walk as children of light, and to share the gospel to a dying world. So he tells us about that. And he also alerts us, as I said, to the Antichrist coming and that many Antichrists have come. In the New Testament, the term Antichrist only appears in John's letters. Though the focus of John's letter is not necessarily the Antichrist, but the Antichrists, plural, who are the agents of the evil one who are sent to propagate a false gospel among God's people in the world, the Bible does tell us that there will be a day when the Antichrist will come and that he will deceive people and lead some and lure some into darkness. His goal, like these Antichrists, will be to deceive all away from the truth of the gospel. Let me make a brief mention of the Antichrist because if you're like me, I really don't remember the last time I heard anyone talking about the Antichrist from the pulpit. So I, I was really excited that the text brought that out for us. The word Antichrist in the Greek means someone who is against Christ or a person who replaces or takes the place of Christ. The word alone should make us think about what, do we, what, what have we in our lives right now that's replacing Christ. The point here is that elsewhere in the uh, New Testament, the Antichrist is mentioned. He's mentioned in Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians, is the men of lawlessness. In Revelation 13, he's referred to as the beast. Not as like, oh, this guy is the beast. Like, a bad beast. <laughs> right? You get the point. Some have thought that, like, even in the... John knew this from the beginning. Like, in, even in the beginning, in the stages of the early church... Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Syrian ruler, was thought to be the Antichrist. In our culture today, like, so that was their context. Now today, we have seen some types of Antichrist. Some have thought they were the Antichrist, like Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or, you know, Mao Zedong or whoever. That we, we, we do know that there will be a time when the Antichrist comes. And he will oppose the Christian faith. These, all these men were thought to be Antichrist because they did oppose the Christian faith and the gospel and the proclamation thereof. They hate, hated Jesus in the gospel message. Now, I don't want to get too deep into the Antichrist because, again, as I said, that's not John's main focus. But I do want to say here, according to 2 Thessalonians, verses 1 through 10 in chapter 2, the day of the Lord, Christ final return will come and will not come until the antichrist is revealed in the middle of the tribulation the antichrist will come and deceive others that's why we must be on the alert he will proclaim himself to be god and he will be given authority to deceive others but well, we need to be on watch don't we in a new world order he will require all to worship him for 42 days is what the bible tells us and those who do not bow down and have his mark, which is the 666 mark, will not be able to buy or trade anything. Do you think that's really far out, guys? It ain't. Our global economies are so connected now. You can leave today and go to the other side of the world in a matter of hours, can't you? That's how connected we are in our economies. Just a little war here or there can completely change Things. So we are indeed living in the last hour. So the stage is being set for the tribulation and the final coming of, the, uh, of Jesus and also the Antichrist. And the sad thing is that we often don't think about it, right? But do you know that Satanists are being appointed to the highest offices of our nation right now? That entertainment and other places are actually making light of evil things? There is a cartoon by Disney's FXX network called Little Demon. Look it up. It will disgust you. This is a story 
of a reluctant mother who got impregnated by the devil and gave birth to the Antichrist. And now she's trying to live a normal life as the Antichrist, and it is just plain out evil, demonic. It's this type of stuff that should cause us to pause and realize we are indeed living in the last times. Keep yourself away from such things. Evil is around us. As John said in verse 18, the Antichrist is coming. It's only a matter of time as to when. John is warning about that. And he's warning about these Antichrists. Well, I can keep on. And I know some of you want me to keep going on end time stuff. But that's not the focus again. So let's go back to the text here. So John literally is warning us about false heterox, which is false belief. He's warning us that because these antichrists will lead us away from Christ. They will not only come out of our churches, just like as John says here, that some of these came out of, or came from us, right? But they will also come from without. The modus operandi of the false teachers is deception. And so it will be of the antichrist. In John times, some antichrist were deceiving others with false knowledge and they were cessationists who were not agreeing with the orthodox beliefs that John and the apostles were preaching. So he's warning them. Now, they denied, as what we know, that they denied the incarnation of Christ. What is the incarnation of Christ? It's the coming of Jesus in human flesh. We know that because uh, in 2 John verse 7, he says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. You're supposed to repeat that one. That's okay. <laughs> Such a one. Is a deceiver and the Antichrist. See, some of these people were called docetists. They were ones who denied that Jesus came in the flesh and they said that Jesus was a ghost or a spirit. Now, if we don't have Jesus in the flesh, Jesus could not have become the sacrifice to atone for our sins, right? So this is crucial to Orthodox faith. Now, again, as I said, some of these came out of church fellowship. You see, heresy usually comes from within the church, not from without. It can come from without, but usually it comes from within. So here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John is helping us to be sober-minded about the dangers of false doctrine and to encourage us to look forward to Christ's return and to be on guard. Now, Dr. Danny Aiken says in verse 18, that verse 18 should be an encouragement because it is a sign of the return of Jesus Christ that it is imminent. This antichrist activity, he says, is indicative of the reality that the real, everyone say real, Christ has come. And believers are living in a period of time when the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. It awaits its final consummation. That's in part why I titled the sermon today, Antichrists versus the True or Real Christ. Verses 19 and 20 again say they went out... From us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. One of the keys to a proper understanding of the gospel is being sober minded, it's having a knowledge of the real Christ and being ready. To stand against these antichrists who will infiltrate your life in, in the church with false ideologies. If you hear somebody claiming to be Christ, be warned. Or to somebody who wants to take the place of Christ. Now, a few years back, there was this um, guy in Brazil, Alvaro, Alvaro Thais, who claimed to be Jesus. He went around by the name of Inri Cristo. And this guy literally got so much airtime that people <laughs> begin to wonder, has Christ returned? He was a nut job. Okay. I said it. He went to 27 different countries. And he even spoke in colleges and universities claiming to be the reincarnation of Jesus. Now, it sounds crazy, right? Because it is. But what was going on here in John's time is that John was warning us that these antichrists mentioned by him were a little more sophisticated. They did not go around saying they were Jesus. 
but they were around deceiving others away from the real Jesus. Notice that John says they went out from us. It's a third person plural pronoun here, they, which indicates there was a group of them, of antichrist figures that caused division among the church. In 2 John verse 7, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. There's many. In fact, in 3 John, he even mentioned the name of uh, one of them, Diotrephes. He, he was around. So these antichrists were not of the faith. In verse 19, John has kind of like this, this formula going on here. He says, number one, they went out from us. Number two, that they were not of us. Then a Alongside with they went out from us, it says, if they had been of us, and then if they were not of us, then he says, they would have continued with us, but they didn't. That, you see, that's the importance of us recognizing true orthodox faith, knowing the gospel, knowing that the message of the gospel is that Christ came and lived a perfect, sinless life. He went to the cross. He died, but then he rose again to the glory of the Father and has given us true life. This is our orthodox, our right belief about the person and work of Jesus. Now, having proper knowledge of the gospel is crucial. So that's why John says in verse 20, look what he says again. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Everyone say knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know. Everyone say know the truth, but because you know it. So he's using this idea of knowledge, knowing the gospel, which leads to the second point this morning is this, that Christ followers know the truth and confess orthodox belief. Again, orthodox belief is right belief, correct belief. Having a correct Christology, meaning doctrine of Christ, is paramount for Christians. For two main reasons, number one, or there's other reasons, but two that I want to point out. So we can know and walk with the real Christ. I said, I said last week that your orthodoxy will directly impact your orthopraxy. In English, that means, as I said, is that your right belief will directly influence, influence the way that you live for Christ. And it is true, isn't it? Knowing the real Jesus is important. And the second thing is that if we don't know that, we will be led astray to different ideologies and different teachers. Now the good news for us, that's what the text is saying, is that we have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now some believe that the reference here to the Holy One in verse 20 could refer to either member of the Trinity. I believe here's a reference to the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, John says, this, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. I pointed out that Paul also said in Romans 8, verse 16, that the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So consequently, because of this, we have been sealed with his authority. And consequently, we can truly know that we belong to God. This leads to the very truth that John proclaimed earlier in the chapter that we looked at last week. In verses 12 to 14, we saw that John emphasized the fact that those who were the fathers of the faith... Those who were mature believers, that they had knowledge, right, of God the Father. And that he also said that the children know him. They know God. They know Jesus. So again, again, the Holy Spirit testifies with us that we are God's children. The word that's used there is the word gnosko, where we get the word Gnostic. So we talked about that. Those who are of Christ truly know him. But now the word that he's using here. In the Greek, to know or knowledge is a different word, it, but it emphasizes something else that's important here. The word here, the connotation is a one of perception. In its literal sense, it means to perceive with the eyes, to turn the eyes or to turn your attention to something, to examine something. So John is saying, turn your eyes and be on the lookout against those who do not speak the truth, no lies of the truth, he says. You see, truth and uh, the truth and lie are like oil and water. They don't mix. So again, he's saying, recognize that. When I was reflecting on this, um, I was thinking about my sons. And often when my sons get in trouble and they fight and we're not around, they come to us and we're, they're, there's crying involved or whatever. And then I go to them and I said, who done it? 
And quickly they will point out, my brother did it. Now through perception, because it's not a first rodeo, we can tell by their body language or by their words who actually done it. Because we perceive it. Again, John is in the same way here saying, okay, be on the lookout for that. And now how do you test that someone is in the faith? Because that's important. How do you test against a false prophet? Well, he says in verse 22, who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. When John is saying here, whoever denies the, the Christ, he's saying that there's an opposite to the Christ, and it's the Antichrist. What he's trying to say is, is that those who deny Christ's deity and his union with the Father are liars. They're not of the truth. The Son, Jesus, and the Father are one. John makes it clear in verse 23, too, that those who try to, who deny this, who do not confess the union between Christ and the Father are not of orthodox faith. You see, this is how we know Jehovah Witnesses are not orthodox. Because they not only do not believe that Jesus is God, but that they believe that he was created. And in fact, they believe that Jesus did not rise from the dead in his bodily form, much like what was going on in the early church, and that he was an archangel Michael. And consequently, then, there's no trinity. So we know they're not orthodox. We also know Mormons are not orthodox because they believe that Jesus is separate from the Father. That he was created from the sexual union between Elohim and Mary. And that Jesus was married and other things. And then also, one of the very crucial things that John talks about is that Jesus' death on the cross did not happen. So Jesus did not atone for our sins. And then finally, we also know that those who are not orthodox, Muslims are not orthodox. Because they believe that Jesus was mainly just a respected prophet, prophet, but he wasn't divine. They decry one of the most fundamental beliefs of our faith is that Jesus was crucified. They believe that the Trinity is a belief that there's three different separate gods. But of course we know God is one. So that's how we recognize there's a denial of Christ and his deity and also his full humanity. Now, true Christian faith is grounded in the gospel message in the person and work of Jesus as revealed in the Bible. That's why we preach it. That's why we teach it. That's why we carry it everywhere we go. We hide it in our hearts. He alone, Jesus alone can atone for our sins. And guess what? He did it. Praise God for that. Now, orthodox beliefs will always face challenges. People will try to distort it. But we have overcome these challenges by the power of God. So listen again to verses 24 and 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide. Everyone say abide in you. If you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will what? Abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. What well, you heard from the beginning here, this expression as I have previously mentioned, is the gospel message, the gospel preached. The way for us to stay strong in our orthodox faith is to constantly remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel. That's why it's important that we all get engaged in fellowship with others and we go to Bible studies, we go to life group, we, go, we attend things that will spur us on to be reminded of the gospel because the world ain't going to do it. Notice that the word abide appears three times in these verses. John is emphasizing the importance of our fellowship with God in a constant basis. We stay rooted in our faith when we gather together and we, and, and we, we encourage each other. You see, the train of our faith will not derail if we remain and abide in Christ. Now, John encouraged the church to abide in what they heard I was reminded here of Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes by hearing and what? Hearing through the word of Christ. The gospel message that believers hear from the beginning, from the beginning stages of faith must abide in them. And what does the gospel reveal then? You see, it reveals the real Christ, the person of Jesus. That will change your life. It is through Jesus that we have been given, as John says here, eternal life. Jesus promises eternal life because of his great love for us. And because of his lo great love for us, he did go to the cross and died for our sins. And you see, he gives us the assurance that those who believe in him, repent of their sins, will spend eternity with him. 
John points out in 1 John 5.13, he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Eternal life is available to us from God through Jesus. And that's why John here is warning against these false antichrists who were leading away people away from eternal life. And for those who listen to them, they were deceived in where is the place where they will dwell for all eternity. You see, these antichrists were leading people to hell, to damnation, away from God. Jesus wants for all who believe in him to understand what he offers them. And it's eternal life. John, in the Gospel of John, John 3, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, this is important because John tells us that Jesus took on the wrath of God, became the propitiation, as we talked about, for our sin so that we wouldn't. Can I get an amen? amen. That's our hope. That's our hope. Jesus also said, John 4, 14, he says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And John 6, 40, and then verse 47 says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have what? Eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. If you're here today and you do not yet know Jesus personally and have not received his gift of himself and of eternal life, I pray that today will be your day of salvation. You see, Christ wants to be your Lord and your Savior. The invitation is open. Now, there will be one day when it will be too late. When that last day comes and the trumpet sounds, don't wait. Come to Jesus. Now, there are many voices and creeds that want us to believe in different things, but Jesus offers you eternal life, love, and peace. It's an offer. Now, don't be fooled. The world is full of deceit. Men with their worldly philosophies will deceive you into thinking that their way is better than Christ. So John in verse 26 says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to do what? Lie to you, deceive to deceive you. They were trying. Now that's a possible verb, meaning they were constantly trying to do it. They didn't try, they were trying. It implies constant action. You see, these false beliefs will keep coming at us. The truth will be challenged. The question is, what truth will you choose to believe in? It's important to note that John never really truly spells out all of the false teachings that were taking place that these antichrists were propagating. But we do know that they deny Christ's incarnation, as I said earlier. Today, lies about Jesus come in different forms, don't they? All I have to do is just give you one. Okay, let me give you one. Scholars in our universities and other places, higher places, will say that Jesus was simply a great Moral teacher. Was Jesus a great moral teacher? Sure. But that's not all he was. Because when you listen to what he said, it changes everything, doesn't it? Survey says, by Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway Research, that the majority of Americans and nearly a third of evangelicals say that Jesus was a good teacher, but was not God. They acknowledge, these people, that Jesus was a good teacher, a very moral one who paved the way for a revolution during his time where immorality was rampant and all that. But that's it. They don't believe that Jesus is God. Now, a proper response to this is given to us by one of my favorite guys, C.S. Lewis. It's one of my favorite quotes. Here's what he says. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the real, maybe I should do it with a British accent. <laughs> Foolish thing. I don't know. Brazilian trying to do a British accent. Not a good idea. It ain't going to happen, y'all. I can do Southern, but I cannot do the other stuff. I'm pre preventing anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but 
I don't accept his claim to be God, they will say. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him, kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his, him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. If you believe Jesus was merely a good moral teacher, you're mistaken. You're mistaken. The good news, though, is that God gives us his spirit to reveal to us the person of Jesus. And we can have hope in that. And all you have to do is choose and repent and recognize that Jesus is indeed Lord. It is a promised Holy Spirit that keeps us from veering away from the truth. And that's the last thing that John says. In verse 27 says, But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. You see, that's why we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us the revelation of and about Jesus. He was not merely just a good moral teacher. Now, if we learn to abide in the truth, then we will not go off in the tangent. We will not go off on tangents of ungodly behavior and idolatry and the pursuit of false doctrines that are contrary to our faith because they just are cool or trendy. I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide you and I, I really do, to keep us grounded in his truth. Amen? And if you're here this morning and you want the truth in your life, all you have to do is accept it. No gimmicks. All you have to do is accept this. Believe and receive. It's as simple as that. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for the truth of Christ. We thank you that you're not only good to us, but you reveal good things to us. We are indeed living in the last days. There's so much evil around us. Help us to remain not only strong, but also vigilant against those who will bring about doctrines that are false, non-orthodox beliefs that will take us away from you. Prevent us from that. Have mercy on us. And Father, for those who are here today who have not yet submitted their lives to you, will you transform them today? If you're here today and you want to make a decision to follow Christ, you can even pray this after me. Jesus, I submit myself to you. I repent of my sin. I ask for your forgiveness. I recognize that you are Lord. You're the real Christ. And I give my all to you. If you pray that prayer, the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you did that, we rejoice with you. And I know, God, you rejoice when we not only come to you as your people, but people become your people, your family. We give you praise for that. We give you praise ahead of time because we know that you are the one that does the real transformation, that your spirit, Holy Spirit, you make transformation happen. And we pray that that is true for all of us here this morning. And all God's people said, amen.